welcome to the Audiobook Readers Review, a space for writers, audiobook narrators, producers and listeners, of course, to discuss everything audiobooks. Today, we're talking with narrator extraordinaires, Erin Marie White and PJ Morgan. Erin is an Australian actress. Bitten by the theatre bug in her teens, Erin has been performing for most of her life. With a Bachelor of Arts in Linguistics and a Master of Speech Pathology, Erin has a unique perspective on language, communication and the power of the human voice. She is a natural storyteller and adores narrating audiobooks. PJ Morgan is a lifelong storyteller, book nerd, actor and secret author. PJ Morgan has finally reached the pinnacle of human form as a professional audiobook narrator. She is an empathic performer with a broad skill set who believes in the power of the written and spoken word to transform, educate, elevate and escape. She has narrated over 130 titles to date, from sci-fi to non-fiction, for B Audio, Audible Studios, Findaway Voices, Spoken Realms, Pink Flamingo Productions and many independent authors. When not in the booth, she's outside playing with her equine friends, hiking with her demon spawn chihuahua, or crafting hit-or-miss vegan meals. As a member of the LGBTQ plus community, PJ is especially interested in stories featuring diverse characters, and has a soft spot for unusual protagonists and sympathetic villains. <laughs> So today we're in discussion with PJ Morgan and Erin Marie White, two audiobook narrators who also each have backgrounds in linguistics and theatre studies. What I'd like to find out is how both these streams of experience, linguistics and theatre, impact the way they approach audiobook narration. This will help us explore the broad ranging theme of how we bring previous experiences and skills to bear on our reading and interpreting whether as professional audiobook narrators, writers and teachers, or as readers at home. I just realised how educational that sounds, but anyway, <laughs> we'll keep going. That was great. So PJ, um, first, tell us about your theatre and on-camera experience. Sure. So I did kind of a smattering of theatre when I was younger, kind of some improv in high school and some children's theater, um, but I didn't really get into theater uh, until about 2010 is when I started. And I did maybe about six years, um, mostly community theater. I did one professional theater production. Um, and during that time, I was also doing some on-camera work, um, mostly small indie projects. I did one, I have one network TV credit um, from Investigation Discovery. I got nice. to play the jogger who found a body on a true crime <laughs> show, which was really fun. Uh, and then I have one feature film credit as well. Nice. Um, and how about you, Erin? What's your involvement with theatre? Uh, so I started doing theatre when I was a teenager. Um, I discovered musical theatre and fell in love and decided I wanted to do musical theatre. Um, and so mum got me into amateur theatre. So I was chorus in productions of like Pajama Game and Singing in the Rain, just, you know, in the background dancing. And then I started dancing from there. And um, yeah, so that that's sort of my background, just really theatre-based, right, yeah. into musical theatre. Great. Nice. And um, I mean, I should ask you as well, in terms of your audiobook narrating, so has theatre come first for both of you? Yeah, yeah definitely. Great. Yeah, a long, long time before. Okay, so that's interesting. So how does performing in a theatre context differ to audiobook work, apart from the fact that in theatre, you know, you're in front of all these people and usually when you're narrating an audiobook, you're nice and closeted away in your private little studio, um, unless you're in a bigger studio. Um, are there overlaps between performing uh, in a live production and narrating an audiobook, PJ? I would say the kind of the underlying similarity for both is that it's acting, you know, both, both are acting, both involve connecting with the text emotionally and being able to perform it and convey it to your audience, whether it's someone listening to your book or a bunch of people sitting in seats in a theater watching you perform. 
Mm. How about you, Erin? What do you think? Differences? Yeah, it's oh, it's really similar. Like I actually, um, I went away from theatre and performing um, when I started doing my degrees. Um, and I, as I started sort of coming back to the artistic side of things and, and tapping into that part of my life again, I started investigating audiobooks as a way to do that, a way to perform. And the first, um, my first venture into that was to do a, a workshop. So a, like a six week workshop, voiceover workshop, which was like general voiceover for like commercials and whatever you wanted to do. And, and it was like coming home. We did all the vocal warm ups that we ever did in the theater, all those same yep. things. And that having that feeling of, I know this, this is mm. so familiar, um, gave me the confidence to be like, I'm going to buy a microphone and start looking into this. I know how to do this rather than it being something that was totally different Yep. And yeah, separated from theatre. Okay. Like I hadn't thought about that before I started, I guess. Wow. So that's really interesting. Um, so are both of you just as expressive and dynamic in front of a microphone in your booth as you would be out in front of an audience? Like, I mean, obviously in front of a microphone, your physicality is a little bit limited because you don't want to be moving, you know, too far away from the microphone. Um, right, but right. you sort of, do you inhabit that space in the same kind of way I do I think I think that narrating and voice work is more similar to theatre than on camera work is to theatre because on camera really? is a little bit more subtle um, I find I have to control a lot more what I'm doing when I'm on camera right or learning like it's a lot more I don't know I just have to think about it a lot more I feel like it's a lot more I'm more exhausted yeah but in theatre, I just, because I'm quite a, a big expresser normally. You can't see my hands at the moment on the video, but I'm talking with my hands and my yeah. face. Yeah. Um, and so I have to really concentrate on bringing that down for on camera, whereas I can just keep doing that for um, my voice work in the booth. Wow, that's fascinating. How about you, PJ? Yeah, I find that when I'm on my game, when I'm, you know, doing well in the booth, I do, you know, I have to kind of compress it a little bit because otherwise my hands are hitting my microphone stand or I'm making <laughs> too much noise with my body so there is some kind of conscious awareness of like I have to limit it a little bit but it comes out like I, I'll use my hands I'm a big hand gesture and if I can sort of take all that expressiveness that I would normally on a stage be like moving my entire body Yep. And kind of channel it into my hands maybe, but I, I do find that my shoulders, I'll move my shoulders and my head quite a bit, as long as yep. I'm keeping my distance to my mic pretty consistent. That yeah. helps me uh, really stay engaged as I'm you working. Almost, you almost become more grounded because you have to pull it yeah. in and really ground it so that you're not flailing around. <laughs> Right, sometimes, right. You have a very limited space to work in, which is Yeah. And sometimes difficult. like, sometimes you can really easily rely on flailing around on the stage and doing really big movements to like communicate yep. things right, and it's not right, right. and when you can bring that in and really ground it yep I think you can get a more um grounded performance I just said yeah. grounded a lot that, grounded's great. <laughs> yeah. do you um do you feel like that energy that you are not expressing physically is then channeled into your voice because obviously the person listening can't see what you're doing with your body, even if you just, you know, if you're using hand gestures and facial expressions and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, d does that energy go into your voice? Yeah, definitely. And I think it needs to. You need to have that little bit of extra because we're, we're, communication is an integrated thing. We don't just use our words and our voice. We always use our gesture and, and the way we're talking, like when we're talking face to face with people. And yep. so you kind of can't really separate them out and uh, communicate effectively anyway. So if yep. you just go completely rigid and start talking, it's not <laughs> going to be the same as no. if you're moving. Yeah, that's true. And yet so. there's a subtlety in audiobook narration too, isn't there? Like you don't want to be, as a listener, you don't want to be listening to someone who's overemphasizing and overacting everything either you know there's a lot there's so much that the voice can convey just in in very subtle inflection and movement it's almost like your range of expression um obviously because people are just listening in audio is really narrowed um and the sort of skill and focus it takes to convey what you might convey with your whole body in a theater context 
is now just being conveyed through your voice. Um, did, did you, like PJ, in terms of transitioning from theatre to audiobooks or, you know, or doing both at once, has coaching been important for you? Like, Definitely, in- yeah. I've, I've worked with quite a good handful of coaches at this point and they all have wonderful things to impart. But I'll never forget my first performance coaching session my coach told me something that I think a lot of uh, narrators who transfer over from theater here, which is you're not on a stage and you don't have to project to the back row. You know, you're, you're right. right in somebody's ear when you're talking into a microphone that's right in front of your face. And so many people listen with earbuds or headphones and you're, you're right in somebody's ear. And my initial tendency, and I think a lot of people's initial tendency is to bring that sort of theatrical level Mm. both in terms of the volume of your voice but also the energy behind it to just be really big with your voice and you can be so subtle and quiet and convey you know it's almost better um I I was watching uh Paul Allen Rubin who's a a director a really well-known director he was um he was coaching um another narrator and I watched him coach her and one of his taglines is less, 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 less. Mm-hmm. And every time, and, and she was sitting in front of a microphone on a stage, and um, every time she brought it back a little bit more, the performance became a little more intimate and a little bit more convincing and engaging. And by the final performance, I had goosebumps. You know, wow. she was so much more connected with the text, and it was so much more impactful, I guess. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really cool. That's fascinating. Um, it's like, you know, the less is more sort of approach or, you know, obviously when you bring something down, the ceiling is much higher up. There's all that range of movement then to move between, isn't there? Like, Right, yeah, yeah. And and those audio books where you feel like you're sitting in someone's lounge room, you know, and or you, you they're sitting just nearby just telling you a story in that intimate setting, they're the ones that make you feel comfortable and at home, aren't they? Like for me yeah you know yeah definitely (laughs) so let's talk now about your backgrounds in linguistics um so this is funny because theater and linguistics you both have have these backgrounds so PJ tell us about your background in um in this area so I have a degree a bachelor's degree um in linguistics from uh UC Berkeley University of California and I got that gosh uh, close on 20 years ago, which is a little astonishing <laughs> how fast the time goes by. So it's, you know, it's been a while. I'm a little rusty, but um, I absolutely loved it. I, I didn't start out in that field when I first went to university, um, but I just kind of transferred in after a year or two. Um, and it, it just made sense of like, you know, a lot of my past, my love of language, mm-hmm. um, I'd studied a lot of different random languages when I was growing up and um, I absolutely fell in love with it. And my favorite subject, sort of sub subject within linguistics was phonetics, which is the study of speech yep. sounds. Yeah. And um, I have, I've kind of applied it in weird ways in my life since then, but I sadly have never found the time or uh, reasoning to go back and get any kind of advanced degree in it. Yeah. Wow. And how about you, Erin? Yeah, so I uh, completed my Bachelor of Arts at the University of Western Australia and I majored in linguistics, yeah. almost had a major in German, but didn't quite finish really? enough units. Yeah, it's <laughs> such a it's such a nerdy story. So I was um, pursuing, I guess, a career in musical theatre yeah. and not going about it very well. I wasn't very switched on. I didn't know what I was doing. I had this idea that if you have talent, you're going to win. If you don't, then you don't. And I just kind of had my blinkers on and was like, of course I'm talented. I'm not going to admit that I might not be. Um, Talent doesn't really have anything to do with it. It's about training and Mm -hmm. stuff. So I was kind of giving up and being a bit like, oh, it's a bit, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get a real, a real job in inverted commas um, and, and give up this life of the theater. I'm poor and I don't like pouring coffee for a living and um, I had also discovered German language musical theatre wow really (laughs) which is which is amazing so if you haven't seen um, 
taste yeah. of Ambira and oh, no, 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 it's no, modern. No. It's modern. Okay, it's modern. very sparkly oh, okay. and amazing. And, and really? yeah, I love it. I love German language musical theater. It's, it's a world of its own. So I was really into that. And so I was like, I'll go, I'll go to uni and I'll get a degree and I'll get a real job. Um, what will I do? I'm going to learn German. So I was like, oh yeah, linguistics, that's kind of like adjacent to German, isn't it? I didn't really know anything about what linguistics was. And so of course I did a Bachelor of Arts, which is exactly the kind of degree you want to do if you want a specific job. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I've got> one, <laughs> job security. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> it was funny, but it, um, it turns out because I never, I just floated around in my like teens and my, all of my twenties, basically, I just sort of floated around and just yeah. sort of fell into stuff. Yeah. Um, which I think I'm allowed to do. And it's landed me here with this sort of weird mishmash of stuff. So I did, so I learned German and I started linguistics and I was like, oh, actually, I really like this linguistic stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was right into phonetics as well. Um, But even just um, like you learn about, you basically linguistics degree, you describe language and it's not just English. It's basically just all languages around the world. Um, kind of the things that they do, how people acquire language, the difference between humans and animals and uh, different grammar and all that sort of stuff. And so I yeah. got really interested in that. And so I graduated 10 years ago. Um, for both of you, do the deeper sort of conceptual and structural understandings of language that you picked up through your study, do those things impact your audiobook narration work? PJ? I'm trying to think if it does on a conscious level. Yeah. Um, not, not maybe directly, but, but indirectly in terms of like having a deeper appreciation for human language and communication and the nuances of it and the importance of it. And yeah, I mean, I think it, it definitely informs it in some way, but maybe not in a way that I would necessarily say gives me a particular edge over someone who yeah, doesn't sure. have a background in it except for the international phonetic alphabet that's what I was <laughs> going to ask because you know pronunciation is a huge thing for narrators we're looking up words right. all the time and if right. you can understand those interesting different sort of alphabetic symbols that describe pronunciation um you're way ahead so you guys have both got that right right yeah, yeah. and the, the yeah. thing that's so important about it too is that it's non-ambiguous and so many of the other pronunciation keys that I see everyone from you know like various dictionary websites to major publishers using they're all different they're all a little bit ambiguous they're not exact because they're not based in actual speech science right and that's what I love about the IPA is you never look at it and go "Eh, okay well I pronounce this word that way so does that sound sound like this it's it's always very clear exactly how you pronounce it. Yeah, I mean, I reckon that's an edge as an audiobook narrator because when you you look things up, you know exactly how to how to pronounce things. You're not kind of guessing. You're not like having to Wikipedia the IPA, which I do all the time, by the way. You know, to to see what the actual symbols stand for. How about you, Erin? Does your linguistics background affect or consciously um, affect your audiobook narrating? It's it's one of those. Um... I think it's sort of a chicken and egg question. Like yep. I think yep. I already had an interest. Like I'm, I'm a reader. I've always been a reader as a kid yep. um, and always been interested in language. And so like everything kind of comes together in the end. And yep. I still I still look up the Wikipedia of the IPA. Okay, <laughs> I'm okay. not very good at the vowels. Yeah but, yeah, yeah. but I know what to search for. I know what search terms to use. You kind of know. Yeah have a little bit more explicit knowledge of like I don't know what this is and I need to know what it is rather than just kind of breezing through it a little bit and and I think that just that the fact that you've taken the time and the energy to study language and how it works and how you know how it works physically it's not consciously that you bring that to what you do but it's still part of who you are and part of how you narrate and you can never sort of reduce that down and quantify exactly what ways that that has impacted um, you on a rating. But I have no doubt that it has. Um, you both obviously love language. PJ, you do a lot of writing as well, don't you? Sometimes, yeah. N- not in a professional context, um, but I've participated in National Novel Writing Month for 
gosh, I think like 14 years in a row. Wow. And I, I also volunteer as they call the volunteers um, municipal liaisons, which means we basically run a region, whether it's a city or a county or just a geographical region. Um, we coordinate like weekly events throughout the month of November, which is when NaNoWriMo happens. Um, so I write in that context, I can nice. say. Well, it's very impressive because uh, I've done NaNoWriMo once and it was intense. I did it and then I saw that you oh, do that's it. that's right. It for like, and I was like, whoa, cool. Sort of <laughs> discover things about people around you that you didn't know. Um, yeah. So anyway, I've, I've got two more questions for you both. So Erin, um, you also have a background in speech pathology? Yeah, so I went from my linguistics degree. I found an interest in that kind of language learning, how language works in the brain. Um, and I went from there into a master of speech pathology at Curtin University, um, which, so it's more than just language when you start getting into speech pathology. We also learn uh, like motor speech. So a lot of muscles and uh, neurology and all that kind of thing. Um, swallowing, we do a lot of swallowing because it's the same yeah. It's the same area. So the whole sort of from the nose down to the top of the shoulders, that's the area that we're experts in uh -huh. um, and what goes wrong. So basically, if you're a speech pathologist, you're working with people who are having some sort of problem with communication or swallowing in some sort of way. So I worked, um, I did a, a stint in the country working with children. Mm -hmm. doing the typical I think of what people think of speech pathologists you know they have a lisp and <laughs> I help them with their lisp or various language learning language acquisition difficulties um, yeah. but what my passion was really was um, working with adults in hospitals so uh -huh. uh, stroke victims people yep. recovering neurological disorders so either degenerative things like um, MS multiple sclerosis or um, MND um, mm. motor neuron which is called something else in the US uh, I can't remember what it's called um, and yeah so working with people who had lost or were losing some sort of uh, language capacity or speech or d difficulty communicating in some way so it gave me a really a real appreciation of what how we communicate first of all so you have to really study how we communicate like not just the voice but there's also uh, we call it total communication so it's your facial expressions your gestures uh writing reading mm -hmm. like it's another way of communicating mm -hmm. um and supporting uh, supporting them that way yeah so yeah give me real um appreciation for that and that audiobooks they don't have to be just listened to like there's a huge like they're obviously the blind community will listen to it so that's a disability access of that they can yep. uh, consume books as well as sighted people um, but also uh, especially children who may be having difficulty acquiring language learning language yep. learning to read they can listen and read at the same time and that can help them mm -hmm. understand more like there's so much more um, that we can do for access so like disability access as well yeah absolutely um, do you still work in speech pathology now? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> so, um, it was, it was difficult. So there's the short story is that there's not enough funding yeah. in Australia. I'm not sure about the rest of the world. There was, there's not enough funding. I worked my whole, I worked for three and a bit years and I only ever covered maternity leave. So I was only ever doing someone else's job and I came to the end of my last contract and I, and that's when I started looking into what else can I do yeah to earn money to earn a living because yep. it, it's it wears you down as well not having stable employment and it was a bit of a it's a bit of a it's an irony that <laughs> I left the world of theater as I left I stopped pursuing a career performing because yeah. I wanted stable something more stable stable employment and ended up in a career but the a proper, I did the right thing. I went to university. I got a proper degree. Yep. I got a proper job and still didn't have stable no. employment, any stability in my life. And it was a high stress environment. Yep. And I was like, you know what? I'm going back to, if I'm going to live, so if I've got to live like this, yep. I'm doing creative stuff. You may as well do it doing stuff that you, you know, where you're having fun, doing what you're passionate about. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. Um. PJ, why do you love stories? 
Oh, that's a deep question. Yeah. <laughs> so many nuances. I, I think at its heart for me, storytelling and, and the experience of stories is, is what allows me to experience things that I wouldn't experience otherwise. It allows me to kind of step into other people's lives and, and experiences. And I think a, a really important part of that is empathy. I think stories are a gateway to seeing the world through other people's eyes and understanding their experiences. Um, I think stories are powerful. You know, they they help us learn things. They help us understand the world. Um, and also they help us realize that we're not alone, you know, that other people's experiences, while they can be very different from our own, can also be very similar. And I, I think one of the most satisfying reading or listening experiences is when you go, oh, someone else sees it that way or someone else has had that experience. And there's just, there's so much magic in in stories. You know, it transports you to so many different places and times and experiences that you wouldn't get to be part of otherwise. How about you, Erin? Um, everything PJ said. <laughs> yeah, so pretty, pretty, pretty much the same. And yeah. I like the way they make me feel. Like I know anyone who's a reader mm. gets that feeling of mm -hmm. getting really close to the end of a book and you want to just race through. You just want to see how it ends. But then you also, mm. once it ends, it's that finality and it's like, oh, I'm so sad. <laughs> like yeah. sad happiness, especially something like, especially right. I'm a big fantasy reader and they all come yeah. in like series. Yep. So you might be mm. living with these characters in your head for like a long time mm. and then it ends and you're like, oh my gosh, that world. So that, I love that feeling. But yeah. also as, as a storyteller, so I tell stories all the time. Like um, my day job at the moment, other than um, my VO work, um, I teach Pilates, um, which is just totally left field, I teach Pilates. Yeah. Um, but I tell, I tell little stories throughout because they have to listen. That's the thing. I have this audience. <laughs> they're captive. 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, captive nice. as they're exercising. And I just tell them little, I tell them about the dumb things my cats did, dumb things I did, little bits and pieces. And it's that kind of human connection. I'm a real person. They yeah. get to know me. They might share little stories of their own, mm. either during class or after class. And it's that, yeah, that connection. Yeah. Do either of you have favorite narration projects that you've done? Oh gosh, <laughs> I can think of one off the top of my head. Um, it's a young adult series, which is my favorite genre, both to read for my own self and and to narrate. Um, and it's it's like a a young adult YA, um, kind of a sci fi, almost almost bridging on horror series that reminds me a lot of like Stranger Things, the TV uh -huh. series. Um, and I just finished the second book of it, and the the third book is still to come. Um, and it's. It's so much fun to narrate. It's just so creative. And I guess I love YA stuff because it's kind of like vicariously getting to go back and relive my childhood in, in a lot of different ways. And yeah. it's um it's like an ensemble cast of kids. Yeah. So I'm I'm really enjoying that. It's probably probably one of, if not my favorite thing I've done, one of my top favorite projects. Yeah, nice. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, that sounds awesome, PJ. I wanna thank you. <laughs> this is like a great story. I wanna listen to that when you're done. <laughs> Um, oh, my my favorite I think would have to be I haven't done all that many but my first my very first audiobook uh, was The River Daughter by Alexandra Manfield it's a little Australian urban fantasy uh -huh. book and I think it has such a fond place in my heart because it was my first one I was and I was just so excited to have been picked mm -hmm. and like trusted with this baby that this author had written this indie author yeah. and I managed I had built my booth and and I was ready to go and I kind of created this whole world in my head and I like was really immersed in it mm -hmm. um and the whole experience of just narrating that I didn't want to leave the booth I was like, I just want to keep going and when I got to the last line I cried because it was over oh. I was like Whoa. I had to re-record nice. I had to go back and punch in again and re-record the last few sentences because oh. I was choking up <laughs> and stuff nice. and I still get that with like other projects I've done but that one was the first and it was that real confirmation of I love doing this yep and I loved that experience 
Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, we could end on a really sweet, cozy note, but I'm going to ask you an annoying question <laughs> that actually ends, um, which is that are there commonly held linguistic or language myths uh, that really annoy you and that you think hold us back, whether that's to do with writing or narrating audiobooks or just, you know, as human beings relating with other human beings generally? I could go first with my my biggest one. Yeah, go, go, go. <laughs> okay. I I think Erin knows what I'm going to say, but <laughs> the very widely held belief that there is such a thing as no accent. Uh-huh. Oh, that one drives me drives me <laughs> nuts. <laughs> Everybody has an accent or a dialect as we linguists like to call them. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I I think the reason why it's such a pet peeve for me in particular um is because there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on behind it. There's if you if you think of like certain dialects as as not existing or or like, you know, I I have probably something close to it be considered like an accentless American accent, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. There's there's almost kind of a classism behind it. Right. You know, like I have neutral speech and and someone who has like a southern accent or a more urban accent or <laughs> you know, black English vernacular or the, all these other dialects are, are marked or other. Yep. And I'm kind of like the neutral default. And there's, there's kind of yep. some weird stuff that's a little uncomfortable yeah. going on yeah. under there. Yep. Like and you're I the s- neutral by which everything else is measured. You know, you're the right. Right, default, right, right. Exactly. default human. Yeah. 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 And that, so that one always gets me and I, I still see it all the time in um, like casting calls really? for books where they're like, you know, no accent. And I'm like, do you just not talk or what? <laughs> <laughs> Should I just be silent? That I one, had one of those always... yesterday. Oh, really? yeah. It's tricky because yeah, yeah. I'm Australian. I'm like, I, 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 I recognize I have an accent according to the rest of the world. And so I'm like, mm-hmm. well, what accent do you want? Like you want an accent. I can't just do my natural one because that's not going to be no accent. So what do you want? <laughs> right. And it's really frustrating. This one had a no yeah. accent like this actress. And I looked at that actress and I was like, oh, so that's standard American is what they want. Yeah, like, ho- like Hollywood okay. English. <laughs> yeah. Now I know how to audition for that. Right. <laughs> Otherwise I didn't yeah, know how. It's just so, and I, I understand why people like see it that way when they don't have a background in linguistics and, and haven't been exposed to this concept, but it's, it's definitely something that I've come across, you know, even outside the audiobook world, just people yeah. thinking like, you know, oh, I don't have an accent, but that guy has an accent. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 you, you, if you're speaking, if you have speech, you have an accent. It's almost like, it's almost like, I don't know if I should say this because I don't know, people might find it offensive if they think they don't have an accent. But it's it's the kind of response that a child would give just from their limited sort of lack of experience perspective of their world is the only world they know. They haven't sort of mm. gone beyond that to, to find that they're actually relative to other people in different places um, who are the right. centres of their own worlds. Um, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in a super multicultural suburb Um and everyone had different accents, but I don't even know if I would have had the the self awareness to to realize that I had one too. I don't know, but you know, yeah. I grew out of that, so that's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about you, Erin? Are there things that bug you? Myths that we hold? The accent thing's definitely one of them, but also, and it kind of feeds into this as well. It's um that there's a correct way of talking, right? or reading or writing they're like Mm -hmm. you have to have good grammar um people are judged on their accent so if you sometimes if like if you have like a southern american accent people might think that you're less educated and therefore that you have less value Uh, there's that kind of it is that whole value system and privilege and and all that kind of thing cockney accent (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. or they're yeah they're not yeah and and it's kind of it's become a shorthand so especially in things because I'm venturing into the video game world it's like this character if it's an archetype it's this and they have to have a cockney accent because they are this kind of character or you're posh and you have to have that like British RP accent to like come across as posh and it's used as a shorthand I think a little bit um 
which is difficult to break out of because we all know that code but then yeah it's that education and and formal Mm -hmm. and people are held back by I think their belief that if they have a lisp they can't be a voice actor or if they speak a certain way um I have a very young voice Sarah has a very young voice (laughs) and for a long time it was like oh I sound like a child uh but then that yep. there's a place for that as well you can yep. there's yep. heaps of roles for you and your voice you don't have right. to sound right. like it's like it's the good voice thing as yep. well the yeah. um yeah. Oh, you have such a good radio voice yeah. I don't have a great radio right. voice but I have a voice and it's my voice yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah but I think those sort of things like that there's a correct way and if you don't sound like this or talk yep. like this or um, can't write don't know how to use yep. punctuation or something like that like you can still yeah, you should still have access you should still be able to use your voice we should be hearing those stories yep and then a lot of the grammar rules that we have are just arbitrary rules that we stole from latin because at one point in our history <laughs> we decided that latin was the perfect language yeah like you can't split infinitives you can't boldly <laughs> yeah. go anywhere can't <laughs> act, like <laughs> yeah yeah, all those sorts of like arbitrary rules. And then, and then that's an access thing too because there are a lot of people teaching that and they're like, uh, you, you broke the rule, but yep. it's not mm. actually an English rule in terms of innate language that people learn. Like you yep. have to actually actively learn to write that way. Not, and so it gets yeah. difficult for people to remember all those arbitrary rules because it's not something that they know innately. We all know our grammar. We all know grammar innately because mm. it's the way we talk. Yep. And then you have to learn these extra rules. Well, you two, I've taken up way more time than I uh, told you I would. So thank you very much for your um, contributions today. It's been fascinating to hear your insights and your stories. Um, are there any final things that you want to say before we? I think one one thing that I want to shoehorn in to, to go back to how yep. uh, linguistics informs my narration career, I left out an important one, yep. uh, which is uh, dialects in narration. Um I think having a a background in linguistics and phonetics really does help with learning uh, different dialects. Um, You know, when you don't have that, you're kind of coming at it from just a mimicry sort of perspective. Like, I don't know what's happening in my mouth, but I'm trying to make myself sound like this other person and and copy their their accent. Um, If you come at it from a linguistic point of view, you can actually kind of catalog the the differences in speech sounds like instead uh-huh. of this vowel it's this vowel yep. and you can you can catalog sound replacements that give you a much more sort of systematic approach to learning right. dialects and performing them right so it takes it from being more of an intuitive approach to being something you can actually consciously articulate or um transcribe for yourself write down and understand uh which i guess yeah, makes yeah. More methodical and then consistent in your performance as well Right. Yeah. I've, I found it to be very helpful. I mean, you, you definitely don't want it to get in the way of the, the actual performance itself and the, the acting should always be the thing that is at, a, at the heart of what yep. you're doing. But if, if, you know, you are learning a different dialect for a particular character or having some kind of structure um, or methodology, if you will, around that is, is really helpful. Right. So, so a narrator could ask themselves, you know, this is how I pronounce I don't know, a long A sound. How mm-hmm. does this, how does someone with this different accent or dialect pronounce that same sound? Um, is that sort right. of a way into it? Yeah. Yeah. Usually what, what I do is I'll actually go to like a Wikipedia article or, or somewhere else where right. there's a, like a catalog of the actual like speech sounds or phonemes within that dialect. Uh-huh. And then I can make a system of, of substitutions. Right. And that, huh. that's been really helpful for me with, especially, you know, I, I always come initially from a place of mimicry and trying to just like innately change the way I'm talking to sound like somebody. But when I struggle or I want to refine it a little bit more, yeah. having that knowledge of what's actually happening in my vocal tract is so helpful to, yeah. to really dial it in. Wow. That's awesome. Thanks so much to Erin Marie White and PJ Morgan for participating in today's interview. And to all our listeners, we hope you got something interesting out of our discussions and we look forward to having you on board again next time. This has been the Audiobook Readers Review, produced by Voices of Today and hosted by Sarah Bakula. Tune in next time for another great interview. 
If you want to get in contact with us, you can visit voicesoftoday.org forward slash contact. Thanks for listening.